Protexius found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Let us pray. Lord, all your treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. You reveal them to us through words spoken in his name. May we understand and obey. Amen. The Sadducees and the Pharisees are two, you may say, political parties because they're very much at opposite ends of the spectrum, both religiously and politically. And Jesus had, as it were, seen off the Sadducees. And here he is teaching in the temple, which is a huge area. And the Pharisees decide to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And the question was asked by a member of the legal profession, someone who specialised in the nuances of Mosaic law and who you could say would enable you to avoid the more difficult parts of it. Because often lawyers see loopholes which we don't. There were 613 commandments, which are a lot of rules and regulations, a lot of red tape to get right each and every day if you wanted to live a righteous life. Jesus is well aware, however, of how the letter of the law can often obscure its intended spirit. So in response to this question, he doesn't give us a legal, an oral briefing on the length, the breadth and the scope of the law. He reduces it to an elegant, memorable simplicity. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and your soul. A verse of scripture which every pious Jew recited every morning. And then he adds a second, which he describes as like the first. And this second commandment is found in the book of Leviticus. Love your neighbour as yourself. And he describes this second commandment as like the first, as we cannot love God without loving what God loves. Friendship, after all, is the nature of the divine. Of course, many of the rabbis and teachers of the law would have substantially agreed with the pithy summary Jesus gives us here. And in the Babylonian Talmud, which was about 150 years, which was written 150 years before the time of Christ, a rabbi called Hillel was asked much the same question. Except Hillel wasn't being tested, he was being challenged. And the challenge was very specific. He was challenged to teach the whole of the law while standing on one foot. So I'm not going to try and preach a sermon while standing on one foot. And he did just that. He, he taught the whole of the law by saying, that which is despicable to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah, the whole law. The rest is commentary. The rest is commentary. 
as our behaviour towards others witnesses for good or ill to the very character and nature of the God we worship and serve. Of course, many don't see it like that, which is why we will always require lawyers. And in the Gospel of Luke, it's the desire of a lawyer to limit the extent of our neighbourliness, which prompts the telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Of course, we have forgotten how shocking this parable must have been to those who first heard it. As for, them, for most first century Jews, the only Good Samaritan was a dead Samaritan. That is how much the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Yet Jesus uses the example of this despised Samaritan, a heretic, a man of wrong faith, to teach right action. As opposed to the priest and the Levite, two men of the right faith who did the wrong thing by electing to walk by on the other side. And he ends the parable of the Good Samaritan with this question. Which of the three proved to be a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? We all know the answer. Not because we've uh, sought like that lawyer to define who our neighbour is. We know the answer as we have discovered the answer by reflecting on the life and the example of Jesus Christ, who died once for all upon the cross, then rose again with a message of new life. Yet nearly two millennia, millennia later, hatreds and barriers continue to divide peoples and communities, as there are always those who constantly seek to limit who qualifies as a neighbour. Consequently, this question, who is my neighbour, continues to influence conversations around immigration, just as it continues to colour our response to issues of race, class and sexual identity. Yet Jesus is very clear. To know the God of love is to live the love of God. Everything else is commentary. And this is particularly true when we set this answer of the lawyer within the larger gospel picture of Jesus dying for the sin of the world and rising again with the message of new life. Indeed, when this summary of the law Jesus gives us begins to come into its own, it is then. Because it's seen not as an order to be obeyed on our own strength, but as an invitation and a promise to a new way of life in which, slowly but surely, bit by bit, hatred and pride are left behind as love becomes a reality, where we begin to trust people and to live in concord with them. It's as simple as that, and it's also as difficult as that, because loving other people means putting others before ourselves, and it isn't easy to stop living only to and for ourselves and to begin to think about others because we all have our own worries, our own concerns, our own fears and we sometimes struggle with these. And that's why the world is in the state it is. Now, you and I know that there is virtually no limit 
to human needs within our world. The whole business of feeding children on free school meals during holidays highlights this. If they need school free school meals during term time, they need to have a decent meal in the holidays. This was always the case, but we just ignored it because it didn't really impact on us. But coronavirus and the pandemic has focused us on all sorts of areas which we once took for granted, but which are no longer and can no longer be taken for granted. The care of children and their support and their nourishment is one such area. Food banks are another example as people fear and indeed face economic ruin as businesses shut down and as jobs vanish like snow in a warm wind. Today there are multitudes of people crying out for help and for support and mental illness is becoming an increasing problem as a lot of people are very lonely. They are struggling just to get through a day because they can no longer meet and do the things that they used to do. And people are crying out for help. They desperately need a little kindness, a little compassion. More so today than ever. Now we can't possibly respond to everybody. And I don't believe for a moment Jesus expects us to. But how far do we respond to anyone? That's the question. How much do we go out of our way to try and make a difference, even a little difference? That's the real question. You see, if things are to get better, we will have to tighten our belt, yes, because there is no magic money tree. And we are going to have to spend also some of ourselves, as well as some of our wealth, on others by doing practical, helpful, kind, compassionate things, even if it's only picking up a telephone and speaking to people. Friends you haven't spoken to for a while, or arranging to go and have a socially distanced coffee with them outside. But we can all do a little, and every drop makes a difference. And our response to others, as Jesus makes clear, must always be the acid test of our commitment. On the plus side, no one who loves and cares for other people is ever truly lonely, even if our love appears to receive no response. And in this, Jesus is also our example. Think how often he gave his friendship to all sorts of people isolated by sorrow, by sickness, or by their dislike of other people. He reveals himself as the one who is everywhere available. Surely I am with you always, he said to his disciples, and they found it so. Our love for one another should follow the same pattern as God's love for us. Like God, we are to love the one who's unlovely and unresponsive. And the way of testing our love for one another is to ask of our moods and of our feelings when we come to review the day at the end of the day. On whose behalf was I happy, sad, indignant, angry, delighted, and so on and so forth. We cannot find happiness by searching for it and indulging ourselves. We find happiness by sharing happiness, by bringing light where there is darkness and joy where there is sadness. And very often, all we need to do is give a kind word 
for sure we care by putting ourselves out. In effect, who is benefiting from what I am doing and how I am living? That is the question. As wherever our neighbour is in need, God is also in need. And he is asking us to tend his wounds.